Well, good morning. Special welcome to any who are visiting us as we're concluding a conference this morning. If you've been a part of that, we're grateful to have you with us. And if you are just visiting, it's just good to have you here at Southside Bible Church. We've been looking at the mission that Christ has left for his church. Um, Brendan McMillan was back. He was an elder who served here and is now in Lake City. And what a blessing it was to see him. Where is he? Is he here? Oh, hey, afterwards I want to pray for you, so be ready to come up here and and, uh, Nick uh, Decker as well. And Sam, I want you guys to come up so everybody can pray for you guys as you head back to your ministries. And then uh, Nick shared on the calling as we just heard the local church and Rodney with the internal. And then uh, Ray, I just, I felt like that was just such a prophetic message of what he just brought. So if you were not here for Sunday school, it was recorded. And I really want to encourage you uh, to get a hold of that. Uh, I know he's been suffering a lot and I I was excited to just hear what God's been teaching him. uh, And it was overwhelming. And I also got a Samia Andreo sighting. And so um, that overwhelmed my heart to have our dear sister back uh, worshiping with us. So thank you. And uh, Stevie Clampett, who's had two strokes, is back with us as well. So we welcome you back, our dear brother. Well, I'm going to finish up the conference this morning, and we're going to break from Romans, and that hurts. That hurts. I don't know what to do. My Bible just flips open to it, man. So we're actually going to be coming out of Romans. kind of strange to come out of Romans to look at a mission conference. That doesn't make sense. But I'm going to preach from the book of Acts this morning, so if you will turn to Acts chapter 1, I mentioned that Ray and I had a miscommunication on what I was to preach on, and I wanted to correct that. Uh, Ray communicated it very well, and I think I I remember what he he told me at other conferences, and and when he said, pick whatever you want. And so uh, Ray wanted 2 Corinthians 5, the love that constrains us for this commission, and God wanted Acts 1, so he won. <laughs> and my prayer is that when I finish, you don't say, man, I wish it was 2 Corinthians 5. <laughs> so that's what I'm asking God this morning. So as you all know, I've spent a lot of time thinking and praying and reading about revival. Uh, that was very much what led me to the book of Romans. And I had no idea what was coming upon this world, and our, in particular our country, when I began that book. Uh, And just what I'm seeing happening before our eyes, it was just such a a mercy that God led us to be there right now. And I've been giving so much thought then to just church history and looking at how God has worked his plan and program over the decades and thousands of years and just slowing down and meditating on all of it. The the joy of getting older is you start doing stuff like that. When, when, When your kids get older, you can stop and think again. Uh, That's why Rodney doesn't give much thought to church history. I keep using you in all my jokes, Rodney. I'm going to be sad when you uh, go back. So watching the the cycles of the church from revivals and God's outpouring of power to dead, cold, ineffective seasons in the church are just throughout its history. And so much so that uh, in those dead seasons, we have to start making the church like the world to see if we can get anyone to even come to it anymore which has been the season of America for the last 50 years. We go out to the world and say, what do you want in a church? And we make it for them. That's what happens when you're dying. It's a bad sign. But what happens when the spirit blows on a heart, a church, a city, and countries, you get reformations, you get awakenings and revivals, and people, again, just lost in love, wonder, and praise of God for this gospel. (coughs) What happens is very similar Uh, in in almost all revivals in my studies, is a deep sense of sin and guilt and shame come over people. Uh, Rodney spoke on it yesterday, the the woe is me moment when you realize who you are and what you are before God and your inability to change it. It's It's a powerful coming upon the Spirit, convicting of sin and judgment and righteousness. And then Christ is seen not as a doctrine only, but as a Savior from my condition and my sin. And he does become a treasure hidden in a field. When a man will sell all that he has and buys it, that he could have that field. Salvation becomes real, and it becomes powerful and joyful, and it takes over a person. 
And then they become witnesses to the power of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's when mighty things begin to happen. And so I was listening to a preacher this week, and he was sharing the difference between an advocate and a witness. An advocate deduces his conviction from logical propositions to persuade others. And that is a part of the church of God. But a witness is one who's touched by the reality of Jesus Christ in the gospel, where there's no doubt. And they speak as one who has tasted and seen this gospel. And we heard a lot of that yesterday. And in our text this morning, there were 12 people, 12 apostles who were witnesses, and the world was changed by these witnesses. Paul Steenblock asked me a question on Friday night. What do you want to come from this conference? And the answer for me was witnesses. Because once that has happened, you don't need to persuade or push to fulfill the Great Commission. I asked Paul this morning, I said, what would be your heart for this conference? And he said, I want the idol of the American dream to break. Because if God calls you anywhere to follow him and preach this gospel, that's got to die. And and we let go of that and we follow Christ. And so I, I pray that all of those things will be accomplished this morning. The Great Commission then will be done by witnesses. That is the means that God has chosen for this gospel to permeate society unto the ends of the earth. This is his means. The power of God in my salvation by word and deed. If I had to just put it into one definition, it was the whole Sunday school this morning. What does it mean to be a witness? I've seen him and I know him and he's changing everything about me. I'm not a citizen of this world anymore. I'm a citizen of heaven. I was brought back to a massive awakening in the history of the world. All of society is calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peasants and slaves and owners, rich and poor, moral and immoral. It just broke out upon this region. And it wasn't done by political means or social or economic. But for two centuries, it just broke out by witnesses. And it swept up millions into the gospel in the Roman Empire. So much so in the third century, it was called a Christian society. And we have a historical document of that awakening that I'd like to share with you this morning. It was written by Dr. Luke, who wrote about it in the book of Acts. And in this letter that he wrote, we'll see what an awakening will look like and how it will come. And it will be by witnesses that the Holy Spirit has come upon with the message of Jesus Christ and him alone. And this is what we have all been taken up into. And this is our heart and desire of God for his church to take this message to the ends of the earth in our text this morning. And so Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for that which the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Let's pray. Father, I pray that. I pray that we would take this gospel to the near places of Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea and to the ends of the earth. God, I pray that you would use this body. You would take the whole body of Christ universal and we'd all be given to this commission. God, I pray, raise up witnesses, Lord, for the power of of the gospel in your name 
advance this, this beautiful message to the nations. And so I pray that you would meet us here this morning as we unpack this and that you would be put on display. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. I was listening again. Um, why has the church become so ineffective in, in our homeland? That's been a great burden of mine. Why has the church become so ineffective in America? I think so few understand the gospel. It's been replaced by so many substitutes, and that's why we're in Romans, of moralism. It's a place where you have a set of beliefs and you just morally clean up. Intellectualism, where we just learn, where all we are concerned about is learning the doctrines and that's it. Then there's emotionalism that's sweeping our land, where I just, it's all about just our feelings and our emotions. Political movements and social agendas and our rights. I sit on a constant basis with people who've been in the church for decades. And we go over the gospel and they've never heard it. And that's breaking my heart. But we do need an awakening. My joy on a continual basis is I'm meeting with people daily, breaking, this breaking and setting them free to begin to be witnesses instead of defeated, guilt-ridding, despairing people Without this gospel, that's what you become if you give any effort to what the Bible says. And witnesses is my goal and my burden this morning because that is how God is going to advance his kingdom. And so this is big. Um, We want to be witnesses. And it comes through the gospel. The book of Acts was written by the beloved physician Luke. In verse 1, he writes, he says, about the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. And so all the things that he did... The Gospel of Luke. He wrote that. That's what Jesus began to do. It was a record of his his coming into the world, a record of miracles, power over the world, the elements, disease, the spirit world. He comes in and he, he begins to do and show this is God. This is God incarnate and no one could do the things that he did. And all of that was manifested to say, Son of God declared in power. The work of salvation he came to do. He came, the message of the gospel is Jesus came into this world to do everything necessary to procure your salvation. It's not a cleanup. It's a look to Jesus. He came to bring salvation, to accomplish it, and to offer it freely. And this is why Christianity is dead in our land. Because Christianity is what you do. You got to do and work and clean and behave. And we've lost this gospel that produces all of that. Now what, what, it's what he has done, te telestai, the veil of the temple is torn in two, access to God. We teach that all the cults teach works righteousness. They teach you get to God by your works. And Christianity is filled with people doing the exact same thing with different names. Dead, no power, false witnesses. G.K. Chesterton that the greatest argument against Christianity is its followers. We repent because God's going to use witnesses to advance this gospel into this world. People who know this gospel and know him and have been born again and are being transformed into his image. And the things that he began to teach, he proclaimed the kingdom of God and he said the king is here. His kingdom is here. I have opened it up, how to enter it, and then how to live as his kingdom citizens, completely different than anything else in this world, aliens, otherworldly, um, that is what he produces. And verse 3, to these he presented himself alive after his sufferings. And so his sufferings, the wages of sin is death, the soul that sins must die And Christ came and went up on a cross because the soul that sins must die. Our sins are put on him and he is killed and the wrath of God is poured out on him on a cross. And he's buried. He's dead. And on the third day, God raises him from the dead. Accomplishes salvation. Our king died on a cross and he now is alive. And he's alive teaching them now, I have brought in the kingdom of God teaching him about what has happened and why he's done this. And so we have the gospel of Luke. 
And now we have Acts as part two in the series. Part one was Jesus' life on earth. He came into this world to accomplish salvation. God raised him from the dead. It's done. He accomplished what he came for. Part two, the curtain comes up in Acts. Jesus' life now in heaven. And how he works now from heaven for his global salvation from heaven instead of from a physical presence on earth. And so now the, he's, he's ascended and we're going to go forth from him in heaven now. <clears throat> and this is what has become so beautiful to me in the last year is I've just been studying in my community group on the Holy Spirit and his attributes. Romans 8 has been the Holy Spirit and what he does. And Jesus told his disciples, it's better for you that I go away, that I go up to heaven. It's better And you just say, how could it be better if you go away? How could that ever be better? How about if I said to you this morning, I love you and you love me, but it's just better that I depart. You'd be like, what? Why would that be better? Because of the purpose and the great commission and the design of God that we've been looking at all weekend. One Christ in bodily form going around healing disease and proclaiming the kingdom of God does not accomplish this purpose. How does this gospel go to the ends of the earth? It's why Judaism was a come and see religion. Come from all over. Make your your trek to Jerusalem to to the presence of God in the temple. And now it's to go to the ends of the earth and tell of this great gospel. So it's better because I'm going to send forth the promise. John 16, Jesus said, I'm going to send the Spirit. And I love this. You will do greater deeds. <laughs> what? You'll do greater deeds? The Spirit of God is going to be sent out for us to do greater deeds with taking this gospel to the world. And in Acts 1.5 that I just read, Jesus said, John baptized with water, but I'm going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. And you're going to be my witnesses to the end of the world. And so this is the transition period from Jesus' earthly work to his heavenly one where his body is now millions and millions and millions of believers with his spirit dwelling within them, being witnesses to his great work and redemption of the world. And you're to take it to the ends of the earth now. And he says, I will be with you always. I'll always be. How? How? Because my Holy Spirit is going to come and dwell within you and manifest the very presence of Jesus to every heart. You actually get them closer than when you could reach out and touch them. I've heard people say, I just wish I could have walked Jesus and touched him. You got more than that. You have that Jesus Christ dwelling and living within you by his spirit to go out and accomplish the great commission. But I don't want you to miss something really important. So let's flip over to Luke. We're going to look over to Luke and come back. Luke 24. <clears throat> I think this is important to, as we close out the commission. Let's go to 24, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 44. He's been crucified. He's accomplished salvation. He's risen, and he's making his appearances again. Same thing in Luke. And in verse 44, now he said to them, the apostles, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me and the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. All of it's been written about me and I had to come, that's Christianity, I had to come fulfill it. It's all about me. And then he opened their minds to understand the scripture And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands, and he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he parted up from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising God. Amen? Turn to Acts 1. 
We've read verses 1 through 8. Now I want to read verses 9 through 11. And after he said these things, which are the same things we just read in Luke 24, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you in heaven will come in just the same way as you've watched him go to heaven. And so th this is big. And I don't know if the church understands why. Because have you ever gone into a Hallmark store? Anytime you need a good Friday card, boom, there's always, a, there's always one. Anytime you need a resurrection card, they always have them. And, and the ones they have the most are Christmas cards. They're, they're always have them. You know what I've never found in Hallmark? Yeah, an Ascension card. They don't exist. Every once in a while, you might find a Pentecost one, but very rarely. So the Ascension is kind of glossed over and not much is given to it, but not Luke. Not Luke. Both accounts record it right after the Great Commission is given. So I, my mind says it's got to be somehow connected to the Great Commission. Why does he... Commission, ascension, and both uh, writings, both accounts. So why? It is just every story needs a happy ending. I just feels good. Jesus is back with his father. That was just a great close to a great life. The ascension is the place that Jesus will begin his heavenly ministry from. In complete victory at the right hand. <coughs> <coughs> Oh man, you're going to need to pray for me. This, this is deep in the lungs this morning. A complete victory at the right hand of God. And as Brendan preached, all authority has been given to me. That's where this great commission begins. So to begin the purpose and goal for why he came to earth, to dispense his salvation to the ends of the earth from which he had accomplished in his work. And the reason, that is the reason it's good that he goes away that now by his spirit being poured out is present now all over the globe, dwelling in the hearts of his brothers and sisters, the body of Christ. On earth, he had one body. And in heaven, he has countless bodies baptized by the Holy Spirit, being filled and led by him to be what? To be witnesses of what Jesus began to teach and do. To be led by the Spirit is to be led into the Great Commission. That's his passion. That the world would believe and surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the role the Holy Spirit plays. And so his passion is for Christ to be put on display. And the way he's put on display is by witnesses going to the ends of the earth with the message of Jesus Christ. One preacher beautifully said, the ascension is not the loss of Christ, but the magnification of of it. I heard the illustration just thinking through Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, after Jesus is resurrected, she sees Christ before he was ascended. And he says, don't hold on to me. I'm ascending to my father. And I, I think Mary's afraid to let go. And Jesus is saying, let go of me, Mary, and you'll never have to let go of me again. They can never take you from me. One preacher said he went to heaven so that he could detonate his work to the whole world. And so I want you to hear this loud and clear. He's up there at the right hand of God, ascended to continue what he did and taught on this earth. And we're witnesses of it. And he speaks through us, and his sheep hear his voice. And it's as if God is begging through us to be reconciled to God. And I witness what the Christ has done on this earth. It's finished. And I've received it and it's changing me. And we go into this world and we're not like it. And we're witnesses of the power of this gospel. That's my only reason I exist. It's to be a witness of Jesus Christ. So here in Acts 1, we have the finishing of Jesus' earthly ministry and the beginning of his heavenly ministry, the universal gospel will now go universal. And so this is so climactic. 
And so my question at such a climactic moment is, how are you going to do it? How, what's your plan, God? How are you going to do it? And the answer is through us. Does that make you laugh a little bit? <laughs> it just feels anticlimactic. Ascension. Go to the ends of the earth. You guys. I've read the Gospels. I'm not going to believe unless I put my finger in his, in his holes. And you, you can't crucify him. You're, well, I'm going to take my sword out, cut your ear off. They're just fighting. Every time he says he's going to go to the cross, what did the disciples do? They argued over who was the greatest. <laughs> you guys are going to go finish this now. I've lived in the church for 30 years now. And I look at me and I, I just, this is hard. And I look at you and I don't feel much better. <laughs> At face value, to me, it seems like a bad idea. But God has a passion for his name to be made known to the nations. The whole reason he created is his passion for his chief end of putting himself on display as glorious for this gospel. And the way it was accomplished is so beautiful. I was driving in this morning looking at the mountains saying, I can't believe that you sent your son into this world to die for our sins. And now to take the most important calling ever for the most important message and to give it to us to go and make the disciples of all the nations. And as I've watched closely over my time on earth, I've watched how the church does add it in its own power. And you know what it's done? It's failed miserably. It will fail if you try to do it in any other power. And I stand here to my shame, knowing that in my own heart, when I try to advance God's kingdom in my own strength and wisdom, it never works. And God is good to let us fail when we try to do this beautiful commission in our own strength. Do you think God would make sure this plan will come to pass? Isn't that a simple question? A multitude that no one can number from every tribe, tongue, and nation at the finish line? The old saying, if you want to do something right, do it yourself. That's what God's going to do. His plan can't fail. It will be effectual. God will, will send His Holy Spirit into the world to make sure that it gets done by Him in dwelling human instruments that he will use to be witnesses to the very ends of the earth. Just keep going. Isn't that beautiful? The Holy Spirit will accomplish this through vessels that can't do anything until we look at the next part of our verse. So something has to happen if this is ever going to be pulled off. The, they needed something really bad. They're hiding in a room, scared. Something that Jesus had while he was on this earth. He was the prototypical one of being a spirit-filled man. He could have done everything in his own strength. And he taught us, Luke says it the most of the gospel writers. He was led by the spirit. The spirit led him into the wilderness. He, he was led by the spirit. And Luke tells us that his whole ministry then was done by the power of the spirit, so he modeled to us what this would look like. We have the exact same Holy Spirit dwelling within us to do greater things, to, to go out and begin to spread this message. It's overwhelming. And so what do we need for this task? The power of God. And the thing in the way of the power of God is our own strength, our own wisdom, and our own might. The Holy Spirit of God indwelling them, empowering them with this great task. When I listened to our guys speak this weekend, I, I didn't sit back there and smile and just say, Rick, or Rick, Nick, and Rodney and Brendan are amazing. I just know them too well. <laughs> I know what dwells inside those guys. And that's what's amazing. As I'm watching the Spirit of God, what He's doing in those three men, it just came out and it overwhelmed me. And Ray's always been my hero. You just keep crushing him and Christ keeps coming out of that guy. You take the Spirit away and you get what we see in the world today. And sadly, many of our own lives, 
You just get church with no power and people playing games and living like the world, no difference, keeping their mouths shut. All I care about is I go to heaven at the end of this. Nothing bigger than that. You get people who really only care about their own lives, their own comforts that get heaven at the end. That's what comes. You get a lot of what we read about of the 12 apostles. I won't believe unless I put my finger in those holes. Guys, we need power from on high to do this. Not a bunch of whipped up people, emotionally stirred up to go do this. That will accomplish nothing. We don't need advocates with just doctrine of the kingdom, dead lives. Jesus' plan is so beautiful for how to take a universal gospel, universal. If Paul would have asked me, Steenblock, not the apostle, what don't you want to happen at this conference? I think it would have been easy. I don't want our flesh stirring people to the Great Commission, that they go do it in their own flesh. We have people all over the mission field like that. They're not witnesses of the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that we would never forget the most important component to this actually being realized in our lives will only be through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so my question this morning, who wants to give our lives, people who want to give our lives to this commission by our King, is what did Jesus' first apostles need to change the world with their witness? and the declaring of Jesus Christ. So let's look at our text in Acts chapter 1. The first thing that we needed was the work of Christ. And he came into the world and he accomplished salvation and then he ascended. And so as we begin this commission, we have the one who accomplished salvation. He's seated in victory and power. And second, we need confidence and not cowardice. And so they're they're hiding, they're afraid that the soldiers are going to come and take them away. Um, There's fear. They're, they're, They're running. They're afraid for their lives now. But he's alive. We saw in verse two. Uh, he, he's alive in verse two and three. He conquered death. Uh, it couldn't keep him. He had victory. And he's risen. And more than something, this is more than something fun to say on Sunday. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and he has broken the the teeth of death and he has brought salvation to us. And in Acts 2, at Pentecost, the Spirit's poured out and the first thing we see is courage to stand and proclaim Jesus Christ at any threat or persecution. That when they're filled with the Spirit, they get it, they understand the gospel and I'll die for it now. You go from cowardice So I I will do anything, any cost to tell the wonders of what God has done in Christ. This is real. The Holy Spirit makes it real. And you understand all that we've been learning in Romans, the plan of God in Christ. I always love that one statement when Jesus said about John the Baptist, and he said, you you who are least in the kingdom of God are greater than John. (laughs) That always leaves me scratching my head. Uh, who's the least in the kingdom of God? That's what we should probably be arguing over. I think it's me. It's me. Uh, someone's got to be the least in the kingdom of God. And so this is someone you kind of think of, they're just barely in, they're shallow, weak, not growing, but they understand the gospel. They, they believe it. You who are the least in the kingdom of God, they're greater than John the Baptist. Why? John is telling about this Messiah who would come in a shadowy way and the Spirit comes and now we get what Christ Jesus came and did, what He's accomplished, His kingdom, and we now are in it and we are greater than John the Baptist and we say, the Lamb of God has come. We don't say, behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God has come into me and I'm a witness of this gospel in Christ. I'm greater than John the Baptist. (laughs) Crazy. So we need to understand our task. In verse 6, they say, so so when they come together, they're asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. And I want you to look up at verse 3. For 40 days he's been teaching them concerning the kingdom 
of God? Are you restoring the kingdom now to Israel throughout the Old Testament and the promise of the new covenant, throne of David, kingdom would have no end, nations are going to be thrown down. They're, they're waiting for the consolation of Israel. And Jesus has told them, you can't know the time. Uh, when I come back and, and, and bring consummation to all things, it, it will come like a thief in the night. The doctrine of imminency. You're all going to be eating and marrying and doing the same things you do every day. And he's going to come back just like that. And we see it in the parables. And again and again, he keeps saying, we have to live every day as if it's our last. Every day is your last day to work for the kingdom of God to put this name on display by being a witness. Every generation has been called to live in light of this. And Paul talked as if it could happen in his day. And so guys, just be faithful as if it is today. That is what he will judge you on, uh, not how much. Were you faithful? And we want to be faithful to this call that God has put in our lives. So the task is between both comings. We're to advance the kingdom of God with the gospel one soul at a time. So he, he, he was not doing it in two weeks' time. Is it now that you're going to finish everything? It's been 2,000 years since that question. And so we work and we wait for his timing and his epics and his seasons. And as a church, we keep saying, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. And so we got to understand that there, there's this time between both comings and we live in it. And it's the ingathering of the nations. And so there's our calling. We work and we're witnesses and we proclaim this name every day, hoping this is the day he comes back to consummate all things. So the other thing that we need in verse 8 of why I picked this passage is we need power. So you, you don't know the epics and the times. And so you're going to labor to be my witnesses. But this big, strong adversative in the Greek, you will receive power in this season when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. What you'll receive right now in a few days is Pentecost where the Holy Spirit will be poured out and power will come to you but not the end time consummation of all things, but power to begin the advancement of the kingdom of God, taking the message that he accomplished to his people, power from on high to ingather the nations. What a great time to be alive. You live in that season. This is the verse that I want to look at this morning. This is what I see lacking in the church today, and I'm afraid too much here as we sit in our own pews. This is what I think needs our attention. We give a lot of attention here to truth and the message and making sure we understand it and not enough to the power of the Spirit, what, it, what will bring uh, the truth to be His witnesses. The Holy Spirit's going to empower us to witness and show forth this gospel in word and deed. But I want you to hear this. We've been given the Spirit of God to do this very thing. So don't think small. Sweet saints. I, I have a sweet saint who asked me from a nursing home. She said, I'm begging for someone to come and teach a Bible study here. They, I have full approval. And I just need someone who will come weekly. I need someone who wants to go to a nursing home and teach a Bible study every week. We've got prisons and writing to prisoners and nursing homes, an evangelism group, and a conference coming up on the 25th. Unbelievers are walking in here weekly. Don't think too small. For some of you, big might be to go across the street and finally share with your neighbor. But if I could just say anything to you this morning, you have power to be his witnesses. And you can do that without all the answers of an advocate who knows every doctrine and every truth. You can go be a witness because of what you've tasted in this gospel. I had someone say, I just don't feel like I know enough to witness. Stop. Do you know him? And if you know him, you know enough to go testify and witness and show forth what he's doing in your life and in your heart. So I just need you to know you have no power and no strength to do this. You have the Holy Spirit to go be witnesses. If you have the Spirit, and every believer does, we have the power to fulfill this command. And it was good that Jesus went away. 
We have power from on high to be witnesses. He's not looking for these great earthly giftings, but humble servants filled with the Spirit to expand the horizon of God's restoration from a universal fall to a universal call for all peoples in a conquest of grace. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It was just not for the apostles. It's it's because this is a commission to the church for all time until he comes back that the Spirit has been given to the church for the gospel to go to the world. And that continues to this day. And so I can't tell you enough, the Spirit who dwells within you desires the nations, the elect of God, to come to Jesus Christ for salvation. He desires that and he's working for that. And he's working in every believer this morning to bring that about. The Spirit was poured out in Acts 2. And he's now working even to this day in the body of Christ, universal, to spread this gospel. And so we have divine power dwelling within us to do this. I don't know if that doesn't make you want to jump up and go (laughs) proclaim him. I I don't need anything more than that. Don't settle for trying to do this in your own strength. That's what's killing America. To be led of the Spirit is to give your time, talent, money, heart, affections for this end. It's His end. To make it your chief end and not the American dream. We have the Spirit of God dwelling within us to bring this about through little, lame human instruments whose outer man is decaying. Clay pots. But the glory of God dwells inside. So I want you this morning, don't be afraid. He's risen. And he's brought about salvation. And your life's going to be a little vapor and he's going to bring the final consummation. And you have his spirit within you to go be witnesses. Let that land on your hearts this morning. I'm praying that it would. And you shall be what? My witnesses, the maturias, where we get the word martyr. A martyr is one who dies for his testimony, his witness. The time this command was given, the world was pagan. There was no cultural Christianity. This message was alien to everything in that culture. God became incarnate, the man Jesus Christ, and died for sins as a ransom. Believe in him and you will not perish in your sins. It was just alien to everything they ever knew. And as a result, persecution spread like fire in that region. And the witnesses became martyrs. And all who received this command, the apostles, died for their witness, except for John. So guys, this is happening in our culture today. The more faithful your witness, you'll be called extreme, intolerant, hate crimes, bigots. The world wants you out of it. For so long, the church has been about cultural Christianity. We've been about just moral agendas. The church thought this was their witness through political activism. Christianity became a political movement. I told you before, I had a guy leave our church, you know, or leave a church because the flag wasn't displayed properly. But Christ was preached properly. And so the message that Jesus proclaimed is the gospel has to be recovered. And hearts need to be taken up with the gospel of grace again. And guys, this isn't just teaching from Romans, justification by faith in Christ alone. When you believe this message, the God of the universe says you are not guilty. You are accepted and your sins are forgiven and you're clothed in his righteousness. And now you can be a witness of him. I've resolved to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified and we are a witness to that. The kingdom advances one soul at a time by faithful witnesses. There's just no shortcuts. It's through spirit-filled witnesses of Jesus Christ that this commission is fulfilled. So have you lost sight of it? How are you being a witness to this dying, perishing world with the signs on every corner that the end is is near? So let's be witnesses. And one last point, he says, look at the sphere. Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. It, It just starts in our everyday life. It goes out and it just moves all the way to the end of the earth. So the, the, the promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to finish the great commission to the ends of the earth by his power. This promise is until every people group hears the gospel. And this offer is power that is still available to you and to the church. We have that this morning. 
to join together, to spend and be spent for this mission that God has given to us that was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ on a cross. Could we really spend all of our days as a church and miss what we're supposed to be doing with nice moral things and religious things? That scares me. I don't ever want to be that. So this morning, Spirit of God, fill us to be your witnesses and not be distracted on building our bigger barns, our lives here, our names, our genealogies, but, but your kingdom. It's been a little over 500 years since Luther nailed that thesis on the wall. The gospel was recovered and it spread like wildfire. And it was no strange providence that the printing press was discovered at the same time for the dissemination of truth and people began witnessing of Christ. And the Spirit blew and He awakened the whole world, so to speak, in Christ. And today, much of the world lies in darkness. The gospel's been lost in many of those regions that the Reformation once burned so bright. People lie dead in their sins and despairing in a million different ways in our country. We need a worldwide Reformation again. We've recovered the gospel in our hearts and Romans. And we need to be witnesses of it and power. We need to give our lives daily to see it spread from where we live and exist to Denver and to the ends of the earth. And so I pray, I I read again about another revival in Ireland. I know you guys feel like I'm just favoring Ireland and I kind of do. Uh, Beautiful people. So there was a revival in Ireland in 1859 And the Spirit blew through there by faithful witnesses. And people began testifying of this gospel. And and, and, and people were getting saved throughout the region and even uh, some prostitutes. And there were reporters and they, they asked this group of prostitutes that were coming and worshiping at this church. And they said, why are all you girls coming to church? And they said, well, business had fallen off because of the revival, praise God. But they said mainly the people on the streets have started treating us with kindness and love and concern. The world had been exploiting them and buying them and the church had been spitting on them and calling them sinners. And what did they need when the gospel came? Truth and power. People started getting the gospel and they're believing in Christ and being saved and the the lost didn't have God's truth and how he wants us to live as image bearers of God. And and they begin to change. And the church didn't have God's love. And it began to fill them with the love of God for the world, for prostitutes. And when the Spirit fell upon this area, the witnesses to that area began and it went to the ends of the earth. And that's what I'm praying for right here at Southside. So a revival is when the truth of Jesus Christ is understood and we see it's all of him and not us. And it becomes a force by the witnesses engaging their world in love and truth. And that's what God uses. The Spirit has been poured out. He's taken up residence in our hearts to empower us to be witnesses, to be different than anything else in this world and have a different hope and walk different and think different. And the question is, will we be obedient to where the Spirit is leading us or are we going to grieve them? Grieve them and quench them. Or will we be filled and proclaim the mercies of God in Christ Jesus and go live as Christ Jesus did when he walked on this earth? And so what will we do with all that we learned at this conference? And that's going to be my prayer is witnesses. All right. Second Corinthians five next week. Let's pray. Father, I pray that there's not a heart in here that doesn't miss this epic, that doesn't miss the power of what Christ came into this world and what he accomplished. God, let every soul in here realize that Jesus died the death that they deserved on that cross. And he lived a life that they cannot do. They just, as hard as they try, they can't put it out. 
And he lived that life in our place so we could be accepted. The righteousness of God could be put to our account. God, I pray, let that overwhelm hearts. And let us rejoice that every other religion, uh, they, they, he no longer, the teachers no longer speak or do. They're dead in graves. But Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and he is alive. And he has ascended. And he is seated at the right hand of God in all power and all authority. And we now are his sent ones. And you gave us this great commission. But you gave us the Holy Spirit to accomplish it. And God, we repent for trying to do this in our own strength, our own ways, our own wisdom. May we be filled and led and guided by the Holy Spirit of God, showing us the beauties and the glories of Christ to preach that and tell that to every needy soul and that our lives would be so different that we make them thirst for the living God, that we are lights set on a hill that give light to the nations. God, please let us be these kind of witnesses. That is how you desire to advance your kingdom. And so we, we pray, God, that we would come out from this world and be separate. Lord, that our hearts would put our hand to the plow and not look back. The King of Kings would be the center of all that we hope, dream, work for, love, treasure. I pray that Christ be that in every heart as he is the worthy one. God, we have such a message. A world that's dying and moral reform can do nothing. Lies, false lies, peace, peace, when there is no peace, will do nothing for this world. So God... Stir our hearts to do everything we can in these short little vapors to tell of your wonders to people next door or people across the world. God, let us all engage in koinonia to make much of Jesus Christ with the days that we have together as a, as a universal body. God, let us put down lesser things, lesser hurts than this truth. And let us bind our hearts together to tell everyone we can of the beautiful Christ. And it's in his beautiful, precious name that we do pray. Amen.